Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and episode 947 of reviewing my own car. Yesterday I am at the wheel of one of the tiniest MPVs money could buy back in the early noughties and it's something I'm also particularly fond of, a small Fiat, which is just a fun little buzzy thing to just enjoy and have, have a laugh with really. So, what I want you to do right now is go and hit like, and most importantly, go and hit subscribe, especially if you like reviews of interesting, unusual cars you don't often see. Do that, watch a word from our sponsors, and we'll get on with the review. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning, and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours, with 10% off using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. Okay, this is quite an interesting thing to drive because in some ways it feels just like you're bombing around in a Fiat Punto because it's got the same suspension, McPherson struts and a torsion beam at the back. It's got the same platform underneath it and a lot of the same components actually in here as well. But because you're sitting really, really high up, it's got a very different feel to the ambience and the atmosphere of the car. Fiat did do quite a number of small commercial vehicles as well as their small cars, things like the Fiorino and the Doblo. There's a certain feeling of those vehicles when you're in here because there's just so much space and air all around you. But let's stop the car, have a good old look around it and then get back on the road. So yes, this is a 2007 Fiat Idea, which is a car I almost guarantee you've not seen in a very long time. I've driven one of these once previously, and that was on holiday in Sicily in about 2004 or five, and that's pretty much the last time I've seen one. The guy I got this car from, though, had three of them. He's got two now. He's running out of ideas. Anyway, so this is quite an unusual thing. Before the advent of SUVs, MPVs were a big thing if you needed to move families and stuff. They're actually a much more practical solution because for a smaller footprint, you get a lot more inside the car. This though is based on the second generation Punto, the Type 188, which in itself is based on the Type 1 Punto and they're both built on the Fiat Type 4 platform, which means this is as well. It's shared only with two other vehicles, the Lancia Ypsilon and also the Lancia Musso, which I'll come back to later on. Now there's one little misconception I'll quickly nip in the bud right now because when I revealed this car the other day a lot of people assumed this is actually shared on a platform with a uh, Vauxhall or Opel Mariva because it does share a lot of similarities both released in 2003 both have this unusual eight light pattern with the quarter lights front and back they're both basically the same size pretty much and do virtually the same thing and look very similar in fact there's no similarities whatsoever under the skin this is based on the Fiat Type B platform same as the Punto the Mariva is based on the Corsa C platform. There was, however, a tie up a couple of years later because the Grande Punto and the second generation Mariva are based on the GM Fiat combined SCCS, Small Common Components and Systems platform, which just trips off the tongue. Equally tripping off the tongue is the name of this car, the IDEA, which actually is an acronym, believe it or not. Apparently it stands for Intelligent Design Emotive Architecture. And do you know what that means? It means someone really wanted this to read out idea on the boot. Anyway, looking at the styling, you could be forgiven for thinking it's actually panda related because the shape of the arches, the bumpers, the squareness of everything, it does have a heavy panda influence, but it is really based on the Punto Mark II, which is a much sleeker thing, although the Mark I Punto is the pretty one with the curves. This is what they call a mono volume design, meaning it's just one big simple block. You could just take one big blue Duplo Lego block, boom, you've made a model car. This is it. And the idea behind this is it's maximum internal volume with minimum exterior space. I think they may have been a bit gun shy after the furore of the multiple because they've played it very safe with the styling. It was actually designed by Fabrizio Giorgetto over at Ital Design. So there is big motoring design royalty behind the design of this thing, but it is, it's not bland, but it's not exciting either. It's inoffensive, I think we'll call it. But this car has two trump cards up its sleeve. First of all, it's a fun thing to drive. We'll take it out on the road in a minute and we'll have a little blast and see what you think. Secondly, is extreme practicality. Okay, it hasn't got clever clap hands, doors and no B pillar. It is regular doors, but they are enormously tall doors with huge apertures for getting in. People say the reason they like SUVs is because they like the high 
access position so you can climb in easily, just slide in. Now I've never known anything that was designed to make old people's lives easier becoming a fashion accessory before. Will we, will we be having sit down showers and Zimmer frames as fashion accessories soon as well? I don't know. But around the back of the idea is once more form following function. They've given it a few little crisp edges and things to try and add some interest to the shape. But ultimately it is a big box to carry things and people very efficiently. One thing it is of note though is this badge, the Fiat Roundel on the back with the laurel wreath around it. The Mark II Punto was the first time this old badge had been brought back for quite a number of years. They've gone for quite a few other designs, notably the blue italic slash one for quite a long time. But in the back of the car, it is a ridiculously practical proposition because first of all, we've got what is actually quite a good boot for a car so small, even with the seats in their furthest back position as they are right now. But to give you an idea of how much space is in here, this bag is pretty much maximum airline carry-on and that can go in end first. And there's room for, I think, three of those side by side next to each other. Under the carpet, we have got, and heavens to Murgatroyd, an actual, real, honest-to-goodness spare wheel. It's only a small wheel on this car anyway, so it doesn't take a lot of space, but oh, the joy of seeing one of these things is palpable. Okay, let me show you some clever stuff with these seats. Hey, these seats are super clever. First of all, they fold in a 40-20-40 situation, so you can flip down any, or indeed all of them, however you wish. Secondly, they recline. They go forward, all the way forward, or back to 60 degrees, meaning you can put a lot of stuff in the front or the back, which is very adaptable indeed. And these levers are front and back, so you can do it from the boot or from the cabin. And also, there's a lever under the back seat or this strap down here, so you can move the seats all the way forward to give yourself an enormous boot, but literally no legroom at all in the back. Yeah, that's really only gonna be good if you've got very, very small passengers in the back of the car. And finally here in the back, with the seats rolled forward and the front seats pushed forward a touch, and these rather, actually slightly tricky levers pulled up, you can then flip this forward to make yet more space here in the back. So basically we've got a transit rivaling or transit connect rivaling people carrier that does a bit of everything. So basically this really is a jack of every trade and there's a Werther's original under there. Ooh, free sweets. Mm. I'll show you the cabin in detail in a second, but first of all, I wanted to show you the last, well, I think it's the last, there might be more, seat trick this car has because to recline these seats, you have sprung-loaded wheels on the inner section here. However, this seat has got an extra trick up its sleeve because that folds all the way forwards flat. So we've got a nice table here, the ultimate T-shelf here on the back of that chair. That recess for the rear passenger's knees doubles up as quite a handy stopping things slopping out table. You could actually set this like this, roll it forward, roll that back seat forward, and stick an airbed in here and have yourself a slightly more stylish rival to all those pesky bolingos that seem to be littering the internet at the moment. Right, let's take a look around the cabin and not just at the seats, but we'll first of all talk about the fabric that is on them, which is this rather wonderful silver and black uh, little checker pattern, which has got an amazing little shimmer to it. Looking over to the centre of the seats, they've got a pressed in pattern in the centre section up here in the back and the base. And we've got like a half leather or half pleather effect going on as well. The driver's seat you can also raise and lower, so get yourself nice and comfy in it. It's a long step up into that seat. Now back to the driver's door. It is a very, very tall door because it is a very, very tall, tall car. 1.66 meters tall, this thing is, which is, well, tall. <laughs> but let's look at the door handles. A large, well, it feels like actual metal, believe it or not. Well, it's probably metalized plastic. This is like an Volvo 700 safety aspect, flat, into the door so you can't catch yourself on it. Big lift up thing, we've got four electric windows, counting them four, rear lockouts, electric mirrors, everything you want. We've got a decent sized door pocket down the bottom, big door speaker just there. Climbing aboard, we have got, up next to this little quarter light, aiding visibility out of here, in this very thick A-pillar, tweeters. So we have got multiple speakers going on. Now this dashboard is a thing of curiosity. It's enormous and flat. It doesn't go quite as far away as the Volkswagen Beetle does, but it's not far off, to be fair. In fact, as I try and reach down there, you know what, I think actually it might be as far back as the Beetle. But it is a curious thing because it has got bins instead of glove boxes on top. Space enough for like a book or something on top. A smaller little well in the front, ideal for 
carrying liquids because then you can put the lid down and they won't slop on sharp turns. That's on both the left and the right side, exactly the same mirror image, and the instruments are here in the centre. We've got our speedometer way over to the left hand side. It's quite weird driving this at night with nothing at all in front of you because even a Mini, which has got the central speedo, has got a few lights and things around the back of the steering wheel. This though, everything is in the centre, so you've got blackness ahead of you. A rev counter revving up, well it says 7,000. There's not actually a red line on here, so I'm gonna assume you can safely take it all the way to 7,000 RPM. So there we go. Big orange LCD backlit, huge fonts, very good of 1980s calculator style. The digits showing our range, 149 miles. Trip distance, average consumption currently, 36. That's a bit low, but they've been doing a bit of city driving. Instant consumption, nothing right now. Average speed, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there we go, date is wrong on this car. And that's all recessed on this, under this hood. So moving back, it is a mirror image across the dashboard. Big centre section, huge blow punked stereo in a massive, massive area. Uh, AM, FM, CD, and that's above our heating and ventilation controls. This has got the optional dual zone climate. Well, it is an Eleganza, so possibly it's actually uh, standard on the Eleganza. I'm not sure if dual zone is standard on here or not. In the centre, we've got a city button for the mega light steering. Blank off there lock and unlock that's something to be very cautious of because it does have a safety device in that it will lock the doors almost the moment the ignition is turned on which means if you get out the car with the ignition turned on and shut the door it will lock you out so something to be very aware of behind that raised up very high like on a Fiat 500 we've got this plinth sticking out of the dashboard and the gearbox or well, the gear stick sitting up here in the perfect position actually just literally a hands width from the steering wheel which is ideal race car uh, placement, curiously enough, in an MPV. On the left-hand side, there is not a glove box in here. There is an airbag somewhere in there. A couple of big air vents, a big tray area, which is curiously not quite big enough to put much in. But And this panel doesn't open. It's not another glove box. It's just a big panel. Over on the right-hand side, we've got our steering wheel, which is a lovely leather steering wheel, actually. Uh, surprisingly luxurious for a steering wheel for a fairly inexpensive car. We've got that classic Fiat Laurel Wreath logo again here in the center. And we've got steering wheel controls as well here. Very nice soft action to them, which is quite cool. And the horn of course is on here. Very much a Turin traffic jam pop. Now looking through the steering wheel, we have got a couple of very curiously shaped stalks which curve all the way up here. And the actual control element is right up here at fingertip height, but the actual access into the column is way down here. Your lights on the left hand side wipers and trip computer are on the right hand side. Finally there's a little cubby hole down here and a few more lighting controls for fog lights, parking lights and in fact it has got parking lights is quite interesting and of course your headlamp leveling options. Back in the centre we've got a long way down to the floor because these seats are properly high. These are these are van height seating arrangements sitting up in here. You feel like you're in a Fiorino or something so your length down to your cup holder is absolutely vast. That's a real arm's length down to the bottom of that. You need a tall cup for that situation. I can recommend these on Redbubble. Then you've got a long reach also down to the handbrake. The 12 volt socket not particularly conveniently located down here in the center and behind that there is of course a cubby hole down here with a third cup holder for the rear seat passengers. Final amenity in the center we have got armrests in the same so it's squishy padded pleather which is great for comfort, but not so great if you actually need to try and get your arm down to the, uh, the handbrake. Now up above we have got possibly the most useless sun visors I've ever seen, as they basically don't cover any of the windscreen, so they are borderline useless. If you put them there and you kind of can't see out the window, put them there, and they're not blocking the sun. So they have though got a little mirror, and interestingly these little rubber nodules up here, which stop the thing rattling against the ceiling. It's kind of a low budget solution, but it shows that at least they were thinking about it. And finally up above, we have the glass roof. The front one opens, apparently. First time I've dared to do that. And there's a cover across there. If it's... And there's a fixed roof in the back, which also has a cover. And interestingly, twin interior lights. You have to decide if the front or the back is getting the left or the right lamp. Important to make that decision early on. Right, climbing into the back of the thing, and because it's such a tall, tall car with big square corners, it's got a very square corner door, which means getting in the back of it, it's kind of like climbing into a small bus. The door itself, same silver and black checker pattern fabric, which looks great, bit of a plasticky door handle, nice big metal, metallic 
door pulled to get out again, electric window, a bottle holder down there, or a cup holder down in the door pocket, which is vast, big loudspeaker. A little bit of a step up in, but then the floor is completely flat in here. So it's a proper good size three seater with lots of space. The center section of the seat is nice and flat as well. So if you're putting three people back here, no one's really got the bad seat, even if they are in the middle. There's also an extra power socket back here. So kids and grannies can run their Nintendos, which is nice. Head headroom is absolutely epic. And because the car is basically so very, very tall, it means that you can climb in here and have a ton of room, even if you're quite a tall adult. And knee room likewise, that's the seat back in my position and I have got all the room in the world. It's fantastic. So as a tiny thing for carrying a lot of people and stuff, you really cannot go wrong with the idea. It's built for purpose. It may not look exciting, but it does a job very well indeed. Now, looking under the stubby little bonnet, we'll find Fiat's 1.4 litre 16 valve fire engine, which in this car makes about 95 horsepower. This is the same unit they stuck in the Panda 100 HP. There's also an 8 valve in other markets and a 1.2, which I don't think we've got here in the UK as well, and a 1.3 and a 1.9 diesel, which I'm not sure I've got in the UK. I couldn't find any figures for those for the UK, so I suspect we didn't get them. But this is Euro 4, so it's ULES compliant, which is fantastic. It also gives pretty good economy. Around low 40s average is what I and the previous owner have found. Right, okay, let's have a proper drive of the idea. And see what it feels like. Well, first of all, there's that 1.4 16 valve fire engine up in the front, which is a proper little ball of fire. I mean, 0 to 60 is not immense. It's about 11 seconds. So it's rapid off the line, up to 30 or 40. It's remarkably brisk. It's, it's when you get into the higher speeds, you start noticing the lack of oomph. It's one of those engines with more power than torque. So uh, it gets you off the line quickly, but then runs out of puff later on. We'll take it on a dual carriageway in a bit and I'll show you. With the weight being slightly higher up in the car and a bit more height to it in general, it does roll a bit more than a regular Mark II Punto would do. The steering is really, really light. The city button, I don't think is a necessary item at all. But there you go, it's, it's here. So if you really wanna make parking an absolute doddle, that's what you need to go and do, hit that little button. The pedals are really small and very light indeed. not a lot of weight to the clutch particularly. Also behind and to the left of the clutch there is a foot rest but it's actually quite hard to get your foot onto it so you don't really have a place for your foot if you've got bigger than size eight feet I guess. The gear shift position is brilliant. Lift off the steering wheel and the gear shift is just there waiting for you. It's ideal. Unlike the 500 which is a bit more compact version of this where I tend to bash my knee onto the centre console bit, this one doesn't give me any of those problems which is great. It is a slightly plasticky, notchy feeling change. When you get it right, it just drops in seamlessly without any kind of feel at all. But uh, get it wrong and there's a slight plasticky notchiness, which isn't quite as pleasant as say, a gated manual in a Ferrari, for example, which is kind of related in a funny sort of way. Wow, that lean. <clears throat> But visibility, considering how fat those apolars are, is surprisingly good. Because you've got these little quarter lights down here in the front, which help an awful lot. Great big tall windows all around you, which give you huge, a huge, huge view out of the thing. If it was light and airy with the glass roof, which is a nice optional extra to have. The only slightly awkward thing are these mirrors, which are a slightly weird shape. They're very wide, but not very tall. So you get a slightly weird view out. Okie dokie, so pulling on to a faster dual carriageway with the 1.4 16 valve fire Rrr, power 40 miles an hour. Yeah, this is kind of where we run out of puff. Fit 50, which is actually the limit along here, and we're kind of running out of puff. It will do motorway speeds quite happily. If you want to get up to 70, even a little more, it will do it. 
It's just not as relaxing as a, a two litre or bigger, larger saloon or estate, which will just cruise just a little bit more quietly. One good thing about this car though is that because it isn't massively rapid at higher speeds, you're less likely to get caught out by an average speed camera or a speed trap van because you're less likely to be uh, accidentally drifting above the limit. Now I'm going back the way I came because I got caught out down that road the other day, there's massive roadworks, dual carriageway going down to one lane. No warning signs at all, no warning signs at all. And I sat there for about 15, 20 minutes and all I was doing was driving down to film something. That was annoying. So, although this wasn't a massive seller here in the UK, I believe there's about 500 of them left on the road. Only 111 Eleganzas like this one. Um, they were very popular across Europe, especially in the home market in Italy. They sold them hand over fist because they are just massively practical. And in places like Italy where the small car is king, this was a godsend. It replaced an even more forgotten car in this country called the Palio, which I guarantee you've never seen if you live in the UK. And uh, it was replaced itself by the Fiat 500L, which is a blobby big thing with, I think actually less interior space than this. And for Europe, it was built in the Mia Fiori factory. Let's watch it roll around this roundabout. Wow, that does uh, get some lean on, but it does grip pretty well. It's not on the best tires, but gripping quite reasonably well. Yeah, built at Mia Fiori for the European market, but it was also built over in Brazil, where it was very popular indeed. And in fact, so popular, it spawned a soft road version with jacked up suspension and plastic body cladding, which made it kind of more, not exactly off-roadable, but certainly a bit more, a bit more chunky looking and could go into places where this one perhaps wouldn't want to go. And I have to say, that has just become one of my bucket list cars to try and get hold of. I would love to find an idea adventure, but I don't believe any are in Europe. The other direction where they went with the design of this car was with Lancia, who did a version called the Musa, which is a really luxurious version of it. It's got a slightly weird pointy front end like Lancia's did back in the early noughties. I'm not quite sure what was going on in their design department at that time, but it does also have a far more luxurious interior, much nicer materials and things. And I would, again, love to get my hands on one of those just to see what that thing's like. So while you could rather cruelly dismiss this car as a, a bland and unexciting box on wheels, it is actually quite a fun thing to throw around a corner because it drives like a small Italian car. It's got that crazy revy engine that just wants to rev and rev and rev. It's got accurate steering with a bit of feel in it so you know what the car's doing, so that's all good. It's got a nice snappy little gearbox. This is a great fun car which is immensely practical not bad looking by any means. Mule's compliant, which, which is a big deal if you live in certain parts of the country now. And really small, 3.9 meters long and 1.7 meters wide. So really, really compact. You can squeeze it into the tiniest of parking spaces, no bother at all. It does make it a very easy car to live with. Cheap to insure, cheap to run on petrol, basically everything you want. It's a bit of a mystery why there aren't thousands more of these things running around on the second-hand market. There's lots of Marivas, but I would say this is definitely the better car. The only problem with running a car like this now in Britain is that because it wasn't a huge seller, there aren't a huge amount of spare parts knocking around for them. And when I looked on eBay to gauge a value for this thing, there weren't any. Whee, this is actually quite a lot of fun at not enormous speed. So there you go, the Fiat idea, the forgotten people carrier, the could have been, the should have been, usurped by form over function SUVs, and its entire genre has almost completely vanished from the roads, unfortunately. But the idea is a cracking little car and an enormous amount of fun to be in. So hopefully, I've opened your eyes to something from the automotive world you'd not previously been aware of or given much of a thought to. If you've enjoyed this, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.